if following Jesus was about more than just a Sunday experience? What if following Jesus actually cost us more than we're willing to pay? That's what we're talking about today. Hey guys, my name is Chris and welcome to OneChurch.tv online. We're so glad that you chose to hang out with us today. Before we get started with worship and teaching, I would simply ask you to take out your phones and text CONNECT1C to 97000. This is just a simple way that you can stay connected with what's going on in our church, but even more importantly, you can text in your prayer request and how we can be helping you during this time. I know during this time, since we're not able to get together physically, we're getting together digitally, and we want to be able to tear down any walls that might keep you away from your church family. So this is just a simple way for you to actually engage with us. So make sure to text CONNECT1C to 97000. Let's worship. Here One Church, I want you to meditate on this song where things of this world can try to fill our minds and we don't understand it but when you focus your worship on Jesus everything changes I search the world but he couldn't feel me man's empty praise and treasure the space are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you I'm not afraid To show you my weakness my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountains is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing. morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who cares you turn morning to dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory, you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens, you 
Cause you turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies you turn seas into highways you're the only one who cares you turn graves into gardens you turn bones into armies Turn seas into highways. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who cares. You're the only one who Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your head this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to will sing your praise again Jesus you're still enough keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed your promise still stands great is your Still in your 
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, and this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. Oh, you've never failed. You've never failed me yet. I never will forget You've never failed me yet I never will forget Guys, we've come to the time in our service where, yes, we've worshipped and we get to continue to worship by giving back to God. Why do we do this? Well, number one is because God actually commands us to. He actually says, you know what? Put your tithes and offerings and make God a priority. And when you do that, he will take care of you. He is our Heavenly Father. And I want to say to those out there who regularly give, thank you so much for your generosity. There's actually three different ways that you can give here at One Church TV. First, you can go to our website, onechurch.tv slash give, and you can be able to give that way. Or you can download our onechurch.tv app from the Google Play or the App Store, and you can click Give on the bottom tab as well. And then lastly, you can actually mail in your checks to the address below. Thank you so much for being willing to give, especially so that we can be for Clarksville and let everybody know that we serve a God who is active, who loves us, and who's for us. Thanks for hanging out. Some things in life are just not worth the effort. I know people who never eat chicken wings. They can't stand crab legs because it's just so much work to get so little meat. It may taste good, but it's just not worth the effort. Some things, I just, again, they're not worth the effort. But be honest, have you ever found yourself watching TV and you're snuggled into that comfortable spot, and you don't want to get up, but you really don't like the program that's on, and so you just deal with whatever's on the screen because you don't want to get up, right? It's not worth the effort of losing that comfortable spot to change the channel. How many of you, be honest, you've stayed a little bit thirsty because you didn't want to get up and get something to drink because it just wasn't worth it. You're like, ah, I'll get up a little bit later. Some may call that laziness. Look, I'm, I'm with you. I might call that an efficient use of energy. I'm, I'm here to, I'm on your team this morning. I, I get it. Some things, they're just not worth it. Uh, for me, 
I tend to speak my mind. That gets me in trouble sometimes. Uh, I, I don't do well with passive aggressiveness or beating around the bush or shading the truth and all of that. And I've been like that most of my life. And you say, what does that have to do with things that are worth it? Well, when I was younger, uh, my brother and I, we'd always get into trouble and we'd rough house and, and we'd get into fights and we'd, we'd cause a storm in our room, typically after dinner time, typically when we were supposed to be chilling out or kind of getting ready for bed. And I'll never forget one night, my brother Eddie and I, we're just going crazy in the room, screaming, singing, doing whatever it is that we do. And my mom was just fed up with this. She came in and you know, opened the door, just screaming her head off like, you kids, be quiet. I'm so tired of you never listening to me. And she's just doing that thing, kind of going off. Some of y'all who weren't raised by a black mama, you might not know what I'm talking about, but all my people out there with black mothers, you know exactly the look and the voice and the tone that was coming out of her mouth right as she was setting us straight. And I remember my mom saying, you know, that's it, I'm not gonna get you those bikes that I said I was gonna get you. And she kind of stormed out of the room in her huff. Now, I don't know why she said that, but Carlo, the, the inquisitive one, the instigator, the analytical one, I quickly whispered to my brother, she was never going to buy us those bikes anyway. And in my moment of wanting to speak my mind and speak the truth, uh, that I saw, as I saw it, I had no idea what that was actually going to cost me. See, my brother, uh, he told on me. He pulled a straight snitch move, and somehow he went and snuck out and told my mom what I said and what followed was one of the worst punishments, spankings, butt whoopings, whatever you want to call it, that I've ever had in my life. I got in so much trouble. My mom was so mad, so angry. Years later, I had got to have that conversation with my mom about it. And she said, really, she was so frustrated because I was right, but I shouldn't have been a smart aleck and shouldn't have been right. And so it was just one of those frustrations. And parents, you, you know what, what that's like sometimes. But the point is, in that moment, speaking my mind and saying what I thought was true that actually wasn't worth it. I thought it would be, you know, cool to just do my thing and be myself, but it absolutely wasn't worth it. Man, it was terrible. At that, mo at that moment, speaking my mind wasn't worth it. Some things in life are worth the effort, and some things are not worth the effort, and that's true. A couple months ago, several of you redeemed the COVID lockdown that we were in at, at its strictest form. And you redeemed that by working out, by, by learning a new skill. It was hard. It was time consuming. But on the backside of it, man, you look in the mirror or you think about what you now know or can do or that new sourdough bread that you can all of a sudden make. And you're like, you know what? It was worth the effort. Some things they're actually worth the cost. Several years ago, I was doing a little uh, speech thing at some fundraiser for uh, one of my alma maters, Regent University, and, and I was at this golf course, and it was just kind of a place I felt kind of out of place um, being there, but Jamie was there, my wife with me, and my sons, and so we're hanging out this barbecue, and the keynote speaker of that event where they asked me to just kind of lead a prayer was uh, retired Admiral Vern Clark. Vern Clark was the 27th Chief of Naval Operations. He served on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and so he's a big deal in the military world, and I was just cool to, that I got to be around him, but then in the mingling time, we started having a conversation and Vern uh, Clark at the time was connected, he still is, I think, connected with Regent University. And so Admiral Clark, you know, he starts asking me questions, you know, hey, tell me about the program. How's it going? This is when I was in, in my doctoral program. And I said, sir, to be completely honest, it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And like something almost out of a movie, he got with like this close to my face, which first of all, that's awkward. But I was in a public space, so I wasn't going to punch an old retired admiral. But had we been on any other street, I'm, not, I'm just playing. Uh, but he got really close to me in that moment, got right up in my face. And he said, Carlo, it's supposed to be hard. Good. I'm glad it's hard. And I got what he was saying because anything worth having is going to cost you something. Anything in life worth having is going to come at a price. It's gonna cost you something. You're gonna be uncomfortable at moments. It's gonna be, require some effort. The good things in life take effort and it's worth it every time. Some things, they're just not worth the effort, but some things are absolutely worth it. Think about your own life. When it comes to following Jesus, the shallows, as we've been talking about during this series, that's the shallow end, and that's easy. That's safe. It's overcrowded. Everyone is there. It's, it's, it's well populated, the shallow end. But the depths, the deeper things, we quickly find out they can be unpopular, and they could be risky, 
and they will cost us something. It's easy to say yes to Jesus when saying yes involves showing up on a Sunday and opening up a Bible app every now and then. That may cost you some time. That's relatively easy. However, what if following Jesus cost us more than just our Sunday? What if following Jesus cost us more than just a percentage of our income? What if following Jesus cost us more than we are willing to pay? What if following Jesus actually cost us everything? You may be watching this right now and you're super skeptical about this Jesus stuff and that's the exact question you're wrestling with. You're saying to yourself, is it even worth it? Maybe you're watching, you've only been following Jesus for a little while and you still feel like every step towards Jesus costs you something. Cost you a privilege, cost you a relationship, cost you your idea of fun. Is it worth it? Maybe you're like me and you've been on this journey with Jesus for a while, for a long time. But honestly, you're tired. You're a bit worn out. You're beaten down. And you may even wonder, and that's okay to wonder sometimes, is it worth it? Am I willing to pay everything? What if I told you that you and I are not alone in feeling like that sometimes? You're not alone in having those questions, having that little twinge of doubt of, man, is it, is it really worth it? In fact, those are the questions, I think, that unlock a deeper faith and a stronger walk with Jesus when we consider it, when we count the cost. We want greater influence with outsiders, uh, people who are, who are far from God. I think that helps us sometimes to, 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 to wrestle with, is it worth it? So I don't want you to take my word for it. I never do. I want you to look at this really awesome story from the, the life of Jesus written by one of his closest followers about his closest followers. And we'll actually see how this idea of counting the cost is, is, was lived out in the life of Jesus and more than that, how it can apply to us today. So let's look at Matthew chapter 16. Be on your screen there. You can look in your version app, your Bible, if you have one. Here's, here's the story. From then on, Verse 21, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. So he's going to suffer terrible things. He's going to be killed, but he's going to be raised from the dead. Not exactly encouraging thoughts for Jesus to be teaching his disciples. Imagine you're one of Jesus' followers, his disciples, and you left everything to follow him. At this point in the story, you've left your hometown. You've left your possessions. You've left your friends. You left that cute girl you were about to ask out. Like all those things, you've left them all to join this traveling preacher on the road and to be with him. At this point, you've spent several years with this teacher from Nazareth as he has said amazing things like, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of God belongs to them. You got to see Jesus teach that stuff. You've seen people miraculously healed from the worst type of illnesses. You've seen thousands of people fed because Jesus took a snack and turned it into this never-ending buffet. You've been a witness to all of these things, and now the man that you risked everything for turns to you and says, oh, by the way, I'm going to get arrested and suffer and be killed. How would you feel? How would you feel if you gave up everything to believe in someone, and then they turned around and told you, oh yeah, I'm going to die? I don't know about you, I'd be super bummed out. Like, that kind of ticked me off to invest everything and, and then he's, you're going to suffer and die. What are you talking about? Now, it's important to note that Jesus also told them that he would raise from the dead. I think that's important. But obviously, they missed that part, they being his disciples. They missed that part and they focused on all of the bad stuff. How do I know? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 22 says, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him, saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. So Jesus says, look, they're going to arrest me. They're going to lock me up. They're, I'm going to suffer. They're going to kill me. And Peter says, stop it, Jesus. Be quiet. That will never happen to you. Now, look, I've met some bold people in my life, but it takes a special kind of stupid to argue with Jesus to his face. And that's what Peter is doing right here. Earlier in this conversation, see, Peter made this proclamation about who Jesus really was. So maybe Peter was feeling himself. I don't know. I don't know what his motive was for reprimanding Jesus and telling Jesus, what you're not going to do is die. 
I don't know what the motive was behind Peter saying that, but I do know how Jesus responded. Verse 23, Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God. There you have it, folks. The very original, not today, Satan, spoken by Jesus himself to his disciple who told him, you're not going to die. And he said, get away, devil. Get away from me. That's, I don't want to hear anything that you have to say. So this seems like a weird conversation that Jesus and Peter are having. How did this all come to be? Well, like I said, earlier in Matthew 16, actually in verse 16, uh, Peter makes this bold proclamation about who Jesus is. He basically says, Jesus, you're the son of the living God, you're the Christ. And Jesus uh, applauds that and tells Peter, listen, that's the truth. And upon that truth, upon that rock is the word he uses, the whole church is going to be built and the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. So it's a powerful moment where Peter actually acknowledges who Jesus really is, and Jesus says, you know what, Peter? Only God could have revealed that to you. So after Peter boldly proclaimed who Jesus is, then Jesus starts telling them, well, now that you know who I really am, let me tell you what my mission really is going to be about. I've come to die that others may have life. And so he starts telling them that story, but Peter doesn't like what he's hearing, and he pulls it aside. Peter doesn't want Jesus to pay that kind of cost. Peter doesn't want to hear about the suffering and the trouble or any of that. And so Jesus tells him, get away from me, Satan. Was Peter, excuse me, was Jesus actually calling Peter Satan? Or was Jesus saying, hey, Satan, who's influencing Peter? That's for scholars to debate. I think there's some little truth found in all of that. Either way, Jesus recognized what Peter was saying as someone trying to get him to shortcut the mission. Jesus knew I came to pay a price for all mankind and nothing's going to get in the way of me paying the price. Jesus had counted the cost and he wasn't going to let even his closest disciple keep him from paying the, the cost. So here's what Jesus says, verse 24. He makes it plain. Jesus said to his disciples, if any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. In other words, Jesus told us, his disciples, and he's telling us today, and it's our big idea today, it's that real life begins when we lay our lives down. Real life begins when we lay our lives down. You want to get out of the shallows, you got to lay your life down. You want to go deeper in your faith, you got to lay your life down. You want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, you got to lay your life down. You want to see others come to know Jesus, you got to lay your life down. You want to see the world changed for the better, you have to lay your life down. Real life begins when we lay our lives down. We realize that it's not about us. Jesus said, if any of you want to follow me, you have to give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. Christians, in my experience, love to quote these take up your cross verses, but quoting and doing are two different things. I know people who take up crosses, but it's not the cross Jesus is talking about. They take up the cross of their own pride. They take up the cross of their own negativity. They take up the cross of selfishness. They're always carrying these burdens. And here's the truth. You can't really follow Jesus at, at, at optimal speed when you're carrying those things because they're too heavy. Those burdens of our, our past or who we used to be or the worst part of ourselves, they're too heavy for us to keep up and stay in this race. we got to throw those things down and pick up this cross of Jesus that says, you know what, life is bad, but we have hope. You know what, they may have hurt me, but it's okay. God is still good. It's that, it's that cross that's, that's easy, that's light, that, that doesn't wear us down, that gives us true freedom. Listen, it's not comfortable carrying a cross, but it's necessary. It's not comfortable to carry a cross, but it's absolutely necessary. See, the cross, when Jesus said this, the original audience, they probably jumped back because the cross was the infamous Roman death, uh, death instrument. It would be the equivalent of us saying, carry around your electric chair, carry around your lethal injection, carry around your gas chamber. This is a, it's a terrible, terrible way to kill someone the Romans, when they develop the cross. And Jesus is saying, you have to be willing to die to yourself. That's what the cross symbolizes, dying to yourself every day. It's kind of a tombstone to our old way of life. It's a reminder 
that following Jesus is worth the cost. Don't forget, he started this whole conversation by declaring that he was going to rise from the dead. That's the actual point of him saying, they're going to take me away, I'm going to suffer, they're going to arrest me, they're going to kill me, but in three days I'm going to rise again. That's the point. Spoiler alert, he did rise again. He's alive. The point is, he's alive. So we don't carry our cross as people who are beat down and guilty and have no hope. No, we carry our cross because we know Jesus is alive and we have access to that life right now when we follow jesus we're following him on a journey that's going to take us through some challenging experiences but it's totally worth it because real life begins when we lay down our way of life do you want peace do you want joy do you want purpose are you tired of being tired in your own life here's the good news jesus died and rose again so that you could experience his awesome good news that you could experience his awesome good things, all the things that you really think you want, and Jesus died and rose so that you could have access to them. But following Jesus, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you your comfort. In fact, comfort is the enemy of deep. Comfort is the enemy of deep. It's going to cost you your time. It might cost you some relationships. For some, it may literally cost you your life. I've got friends watching this right now who live in the country of Myanmar, and they know exactly what I'm talking about. Following Jesus could absolutely cost you your life. However, following Jesus is always worth the cost because what he gives is priceless. I believe that the ROI on a relationship with Jesus is not just eternal life. It's abundant life right now. The return on investment with a relationship with Jesus is not just eternal life, it's abundant life right now. It's peace and joy and hope right now and purpose right now. Here's the question. Are you willing to pay the cost? Is it worth it to you? Let me rephrase that question with what Jesus said. Verse 26, Jesus said, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Think about that. Is anything worth more than your God-given purpose? Is anything worth more than seeing a hurting person find healing? Is anything worth more than seeing a broken family put back together? Is anything worth more than seeing oppressed people find freedom? Following Jesus will cost us something, and the price is very simple our lives. Let me just ask you bluntly today, would you give Jesus your life? Have you given Jesus your life? See, shallow Christianity is easy. It's not inconvenient. doesn't ruffle any feathers. doesn't hold you accountable. stays out of your business. It overlooks injustice. It avoids messy people. It only requires mental assent, a prayer or two. I actually think you could be a Christian and live in the shallows. However, if you want to experience deep life change, if you want to see the world changed for better, if you're tired of the status quo, then you have to take a step into something deeper. And that requires surrendering your entire life to Jesus because real life begins when we lay our lives down. So what do we do with it? I think Jesus gave us a pretty amazing game plan for living this out. The first thing we have to do is give up. We have to give up. We have to surrender. Stop trying to control your life. We've learned over the last several months as a people, as a country, that we control nothing. I don't know about you, but I had plans for 2020 that didn't look anything like 2020 turned out. What do we do with this? We give up. We surrender. We say, I'm going to stop trying to live for myself. I challenge you this week to surrender one thing to Jesus, one thing that you know you probably shouldn't be holding on to. One thing that's taking up so much of your time and energy, it's almost become like an idol in your life. It's the object of your worship. Would you let that thing go? And it, you know, don't think anything crazy. I'm not saying go sell your car unless you know, really feel you want to do that. I'm saying something like the attitude, that grudge that you're holding on to, that worry that you're holding on to, that, that area where you're trying to control someone else's life. You know, Whatever it is, give it up this week. Second thing you do is you take up your cross. So I'm going to give up something, but the exchange is I'm going to take up something. That means I'm going to embrace the challenges of following Jesus. That means I might have a tough conversation with a friend. That means I'm going to stand up for truth. 
I'm going to stand up against injustice. I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to behave like Jesus in a world where a lot of people aren't behaving like Jesus. I'm going to love. I'm going to choose love over myself. I'm going to take up my cross, and it's going to cost me something. It's a beautiful exchange. I'm going to give up my attitude problems. I'm going to give up my anger. I'm going to give up that addiction. I'm going to give up that thing that I think I have to have. And instead, I'm going to take up the good things that Jesus has for me. And then, third step is, well, follow Jesus. No matter what, walk like Jesus walked. Very simple. I'm just going to try my, with his help, I'm going to do the things that he did. That means I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to pray for people who are doing me wrong. I'm going to live generously. I'm going to stand up for people who are in the margins. I'm going to consider the poor. I'm going to consider the broken. I'm going to speak truth to power. I'm going to do all those things. That's what following Jesus really is all about. It's not just about showing up to to a Sunday experience. It's not just about reading a Bible. It's about Monday through Saturday, does my life reflect someone who's counted the cost and is all in for this Jesus stuff. Hey, be a part of Sunday experiences. Hey, give financially. Be in a small group. All these amazing things that we do as we're taking steps toward Jesus, they all help us grow. They all help us get closer to God, closer to each other. They all help us have influence with people who've not said yes to Jesus. I'm in no way saying that the the disciplines or the practices of being a Christian are not necessary. What I'm saying is there is this cost associated with this deeper walk with Jesus, and we have to be willing to pay that price. When it comes to following Jesus, the shallow end is populated, and it's safe, and it's cozy. But in the depths, that's where real life change happens. That's where the awesomeness of following Jesus takes place. Is it worth it? Absolutely, because real life begins when we lay our lives down. Pray with me. God, I thank you for your grace and goodness, for your power. Right now, I pray God, for everyone who's watching right now, especially the one who has not yet said yes to you, they've thought about it. They're they're watching a Sunday message, a, a church service message right now, whether they're watching it on Sunday or Wednesday, they're watching this message, God, because there's something in them that's drawn them here, but they haven't said yes to you. I pray right now where they're at, they would just say something like this, God, help me. I need you. Jesus, forgive me for trying to figure out life on my own. Forgive me for just my brokenness and doing the things the way I want them to do, for sinning against you. And instead of living that life, God, I want to follow you. I want to follow Jesus. So I'm going to take a step right now and believe in you and say you are the Son of God. You are alive. You did die for me. And God, I pray the person right now praying that prayer in their way where they are, that God, your power would do what only it could do. You would save. You would show up. You would transform their life as they begin this journey following you. God, I pray for all the people listening and watching and connecting who are connected to you, who've been following you for whether it's a week or for years, God, that we would all count the cost and be willing to pay that price because we know it's worth it, because we know there's nothing that compares to this adventurous life of going all in for you. I thank you that we don't have to earn our salvation. We don't have to earn your love. Counting the cost means, God, that we're all in, and we're going to go on this journey with you. We're thankful for it. Thank you, God, that you have more for us, and you want us to access that more. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for hanging out with us digitally today. We're so honored that you call OneChurch.tv your home, and I would simply say, if you have family right now, if you have children, or if you have students, the experience isn't over. In fact, it's just beginning, because as this service is ending, we're inviting you to go to OneChurch.tv slash kids or OneChurch.tv slash students. And if you do that, it's a way that parents and children and students can learn together. One of the things that we talk about here a lot at OneChurch.tv is that what happens at home is way more important than what happens at church. And as soon as this video is over, you can go and spend some time with your kids or your students learning together as a family. So thanks for hanging out with us today. And this week, don't forget, go and be the church. Hey, OneChurch.tv, we're so excited to finally unveil where we're going to be having our August the 9th service. 
That's in like a week, isn't it, Carlo? Yeah, week. Really excited about it. You know, we the staff put this out there, and we're like, hey, we're going to pick this day. We feel like God's calling us to do this. And it was a big step of faith for us, and we didn't know where we are going to be at. So um, we are currently standing in our old offices at 2111 Trenton Road. And a huge shout out to the church who's uh, meeting in here, Elevate and Bruce. Uh, they're allowing us to be here, and we're going to do two services on August the 9th, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So you, many of you guys, if one church is your home, you know this location well. It's right off of Trent Road, right next to Dollar General and Freddy's, and right down from our current office complex as well. So tell them about the details of what we're doing. Yeah, I know many of you have safety on your mind. You're thinking about what are we going to do for social distancing. We will have a more detailed video hopefully out to you within the next week. But let me just assure you, we have plenty of space in the large gathering room for you to sit in family groups or socially distanced if there's only one or two of you. So there's plenty of space inside of the worship space. And we will have child care for babies through two years old. So that's August 9th, babies through two years old. We'll keep evaluating and see what we can add, but just know for babies through two, we will have child care. It'll be safe. Volunteers will be masked up. It'll be clean. You don't have to worry about that. And if you're a parent and you're not comfortable yet, maybe dropping your kid into one of those uh, kids' environments, we'll also have a space just for you where you can watch on a screen but still be kind of with us here on site at 2111 Trenton Road. So again, we'll have stuff clean. There'll be hand sanitizer. Us as a staff, if we're in any tight corridor type area, believe us, we're going to wear a mask. We encourage you to wear a mask. We encourage you. We want everyone to just feel good at their comfort level. But again, we want to be safety first. We want to think about the other person more than ourselves. And so we'll have masks if you don't have one and you would like one. We're going to sanitize between services. So we are just so excited. 9 and 11. Finally, to be gathering back for the first time since March. Oh my gosh, isn't that crazy? Yeah. 21 weeks wow. of us being digital online and we actually get to meet in person. So it almost awesome. makes me want to hook. Oh, no, no, you don't do that. <laughs> Hope to see you guys August the 9th, 9 and 11 o'clock.